name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to transition right now to uh, our series as we've been going through the study of identity, God's design for sexuality. Once again, we want to welcome those of you that are tuning in online. As I share with you in the middle of this week, as an e-news was sent out, I'm going to be giving a little bit more of a content warning uh, this, this morning because, well, we also have the children upstairs because of the nature of the issue we're going to be talking about. I would invite you, if you have your Bibles, to take them out to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, if you didn't bring a Bible, you'll see the words there on your screen. And uh, those of you that are tuning in online, you'll see the words there as well. Romans chapter 12, I'm just going to read the first two verses of this chapter, says this, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray once again. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would guide us as we examine the issues and the matters you would have us to discuss this morning. Jesus, would you be glorified? And would you show us how to be true worshipers of you, that we would be living sacrifices, that we would present our bodies in a way that honors you in every way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, a few weeks before I became the pastor here at Clayhouse Church, uh, I was on a trip uh, visiting some extended family in Pennsylvania. And while I was there, I received a call from a representative from my bank that said my account was hacked and money was taken out of the account and that my personal information was compromised. Uh, I was a victim of identity theft. And for the next uh, few weeks and months and years, uh, it seemed that uh, everything was kind of in a tailspin. So you may not have known that when I was coming here the first few Sundays to pastor, that I was dealing with all this kind of stuff in the background, but it was true. I had numerous calls to banks and identity theft representatives, uh, filling out police reports for the money that was taken. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had to experience this yourself, but you feel completely violated. Uh, I was angry and bitter at the perpetrator or perpetrators who did this. I lost sleep during the night. Uh, My peace was gone. Uh, Thankfully, the bank uh, reimbursed the money that was lost, and about a year later, I received an envelope in the mail from a lawyer who said that the hacker had actually been caught in New Jersey, and he was asking if I wanted to be a part of a class action lawsuit that involved numerous people that were also compromised with regarding their identity. And thankfully, God had so worked in my heart and mind at that time that I had released that bitterness and I had released that anger and just trusted that God was going to work this situation out. And I forgave this man and I did not file the lawsuit. You know, identity theft is a really big issue in this country. As I mentioned, maybe some of us have experienced this personally. And it's quite a traumatic thing to feel violated in that way where money is taken and you feel like anybody can use your name and your information and your social security number to be able to do things uh, without your permission. You know, it's interesting as I was thinking about that story as I relate it to what we're going to talk about this morning, I realized that the devil is in the business of identity theft. And I realized, obviously, that he was motivating those that were greedy to try to literally hack into accounts, but I'm not talking specifically about that kind of identity theft here today, the kind of stealing of information. What I'm talking about when I say that the devil is in the business of identity theft, I'm talking about destroying a person's sense of identity. And one of the major ways the devil steals a person's identity is in the area of transgenderism. Getting people to believe lies about themselves 
and so to, so to deceive them about who God created them to be. This is also identity theft. Now, we talked just a few weeks ago about the Genesis account, how God made humans male and female, and we talked about God's design for, for marriage and for sexuality and for intimacy in that way. And we also made it very clear as we went through Genesis that God created our bodies as good. The Bible, as we examine it, is pro-body. And by contrast, you could say that the secular worldview, as seen within transgenderism, has revived kind of an ancient Gnostic disdain for the body. And I'll explain a little bit more about this in just a few moments. But you know, friends, although God created our bodies as good, the fall devastated our bodies. Certainly, we we deal with sickness, we deal with death. And sadly, the fall has affected our minds and our thinking, leading us to confusion, and many as well to confusion about their bodies. And today, many in our culture have accepted a way of thinking that demeans the body and alienates people from their biological sex. As I mentioned, transgenderism is indeed a form of identity theft. So when we use this term transgenderism, we have to ask the question, well, what is it? it? How do we define it? Well, according to Oxford Dictionary, transgenderism is denoting or relating to a person whose gender identity does not correspond with the sex registered for them at birth. This is others, uh, clinical uh, psychologists and others within the medical uh, spheres call it gender dysphoria. They say it this way, the state of severe distress or unhappiness caused by feeling that one's gender identity does not match one's sex as, at, as registered at birth. Many will say, and we've often heard in our culture or we've seen on television, I feel like a woman trapped inside a man's body or a man in a woman's body. So we have to kind of step back as we examine this, and of course, this is not something that maybe is distant for, for many of us. Some of us are very aware of friends or family or that, that are struggling with these issues. Dare I say there may be somebody here to the, that you yourself has struggled with this. We have to ask the question, what are the root causes of transgenderism? Well, first of all, as we said very clearly, the fall and its confusion that the devil brings is the foundational issue and the root cause of these kind of issues. But much of this confusion today is the result of a dualistic way of thinking. Dualism is a metaphysical stance that the mind and the body are two distinct substances, each with an essential nature. Nancy Piercy, in her book, Love Thy Body, which is a read read that I would highly recommend you check out, she says it this way, Dualism has created a fractured, fragmented view of the human being in which the body is treated as separate from the authentic self. Christianity holds that the body and soul together form an integrated unity. We are embodied souls. But by contrast, dualism sets the body against the person as though they were two separate things merely stuck together. And so many in our culture today have adopted this dualistic way of thinking, that the mind and the body are separate from each other. And therefore, one can potentially feel that their gender identity doesn't match the gender they were assigned at birth. Now, I used a few words there that it's important for me to kind of define uh, very clearly. I want to give you a bit of a, a kind of a lexicon of words used by G-L-E-S-E-N, which stands for Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Educational Network, which is actually used as a manual in our public schools here today. The first word is assignment. Uh, this is defined as the gender is assigned at birth that is determined by our physical body to be male or female. This assignment is d- decided by doctors and parents and not the individual. So one is assigned according to this uh, understanding what one is assigned to at birth. This, the next 
word or phrase is gender identity. This is now an individual's internal, deeply felt sense of being either male or female or something other or in between. Gender identity can be different from one's own biological sex. So the real me has a true sex that is actually apart from my body, according to this understanding. Now, there's another word maybe you've heard it out there, cisgender. This is defined as individuals who have a gender identity that matches the sex that they were assigned at birth. Again, this, to use this lexicon of language. And the final uh, definition for a word is gender expression. How an individual behaves or expresses themselves, such as appearance or dress or mannerisms, or speech patterns, or social interactions, which can be perceived as either masculine or feminine. So you could say, in summary, according to this dualistic view, one's gender identity may not match one's biological sex, while one's gender expression might not match their birth assigned gender. That th this is supposed to be important uh, information for all educator, educators and all of us in America to grasp. You know, as a result of this kind of normalization, everyone else has to change. No longer is gender referred to as male and female, as was traditionally determined by one's body. Apparently, this is outmoded and uh, kind of a primitive concept we must now accept dualism, and which is really fractured and confused and completely inconsistent with God's original design. Now, I, I realize that I've shared a lot of terms here and probably am kind of rapid-firing a lot of these. Maybe many of you have studied up on, on each of these uh, definitions and so forth, but I barely scratched the surface of this new queer lexicon. So today we can't insist that someone must be either man or woman. Some people may identify as neither gender or both genders or another gender altogether. And so we've kind of opened up this Pandora's box of sexualities that must now be accepted. Many contexts, uh, now we are asked to ask people what is the respectful pronoun that we are to use so that we as a community can make a more comfortable place for them. And so now we are being told what kind of language we must use. And we're, in the weeks ahead, we're going to talk about how we need to and how the Lord would have us respond to each of these issues and that issue in particular. But the bottom line is this. If nature and biology doesn't reveal God's will, then it is a morally neutral realm where we as humans can impose our own will on it. And this is indeed what is going on in our culture today. People are trying to impose their will upon what God has clearly made. And this is actually profoundly disrespectful to the human body. In, in essence, the body doesn't really matter at all. You know, we've moved away from reality and elevated feelings above truth. And gender is now considered a kind of a social or personal construction. You know, it's interesting, when I, when I studied years ago uh, philosophy back in college, uh, one of my main philosophers that I focused on and studied was Immanuel Kant, the German uh, ph philosopher. I dealt a lot with Kantian ethics. And Kant said this, the mind is the lawgiver to nature. And so for Kant, uh, the enlightened self is completely autonomous. Autonomous literally means a law unto oneself. Auto, self, nomos is law. And for the autonomous self, any outside source of moral law is inherently oppressive. According to this perspective, our feelings are what matters most. They are for us our truth and we can essentially create our own world. Facts, therefore, don't matter either, only the interpretations of those facts. And so our minds impose our own meanings on what we deal with. And so today in our culture, 
Everyone in our culture seems to want to validate people's thoughts and desires so that they will flourish. But the problem is, is when you validate people that are believing lies, you're leading them to further confusion. You know, if you were to think, for example, of a young woman who struggles with anorexia or bulimia, and the reality is she is skin and bones, but she thinks that she is fat. Her truth isn't matching reality. Now, it would be morally reprehensible to join her in the lie that she believes and say, yes, you are fat, because it would only lead her to perpetuate that lie. And this could eventually destroy her if she continues along this path. My friends, there is objective truth. Science and biology do matter. And so the transgender narrative completely disassociates gender from biological sex. Yet maleness and femaleness are undeniable physical realities. We cannot deny that. Paula Johnson, who is a a cardiologist, said it this way, Every cell has a sex. And what that means is that men and women are different across all of our organs, from our brains to our hearts, our lungs, and our joints. In other words, no matter what your gender philosophy is, when you are ill and the doctor puts you on the operating table, they still need to know your original biological sex in order to give you the best possible care. And so we're, we, we see clarity that men and women are different even down from a molecular level. We're different. And this is the way God has designed it. You know, the culture today said, well, the answer is, is if you're struggling, if you feel like a, a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body, to, to think about gender reassignment, that that's the solution for you. And so today the acceptment, accepted treatment is not to help people change their inner feelings of gender identity to get them to match their body, but to change their body through hormones. And through surgery, to be able to match their feelings. Actually, it's the complete opposite of what we should be doing. Often we hear the term grooming today. It's a word used to describe the effort to desensitize children to the sexual abuse of adults. And this is the culture that we really find ourselves in today because parents who object to having their children transition from one gender to another are called bigots. And it's easy for many people in these kind of clinics to isolate teenagers to be able to manipulate them and to control them. And that is what is going on in America today with this gender reassignment therapy. It's child abuse. And it's utterly tragic. You know, there's a fascinating article that I read earlier this year. Uh, You'll see there on the screen a picture of the, the lady that wrote it. Uh, it's, it was written in St. Louis, Missouri uh, in, earlier this year, and it's t- entitled, I Thought I Was Saving Trans Kids, Now I'm Blowing the Whistle. And this actually tells the story of a woman named Jamie Reed who is part of the LGBTQ plus community herself. So this is an insider writing this article. And he's, she was a caseworker uh, at the Washington University in their transgender clinic. And she said, after years of witnessing the young patients and the kind of treatments they were receiving and the emotional effects of hormonal treatments and gender-altering surgeries, she blew the whistle. She claimed that families were rushed to treatment, mental health issues were ignored, and side effects of hormone therapy were glossed over. She said that she could no longer work there. Again, she identifies herself as queer. It's a fascinating article that actually has put the transgender clinic and others like it under significant scrutiny. I mean, this, she, this, this article has actually been kind of an explosion in a lot of the world of the transgender movement today. And the media is doing what they can to discredit this woman, but she saw what was going on from the inside as one of the queer, in, in the queer community. And I actually, this is an article I try to reference to non-Christian friends because here's somebody who's they're going to esteem that she's going to give value and she's saying, hey, look, this is wrong. What's taking place? You know, Clayhouse 
altering one's body in order to find peace is never the real solution because the real issue is one of the heart and of the mind. You know, it's interesting. Some people suffer from what is now called body integrity identity disorder. I don't know if you've heard of this, but these are otherwise normal people who are tormented by their limbs. I'm speaking of perfectly healthy and fully functioning arms and legs who are now obsessed with having them surgically removed. The right leg must be severed below the knee and their left arm must be removed. Only then will they be at peace. I'm not making this stuff up. The technical name for this is apotemnophilia. It's chaotic, it's irrational, and it's absurd. But this is kind of the stuff that we're seeing going on in our culture today. That might be a rare type of condition, but nonetheless, we see the confusion that is taking over the medical world, that's taking over our educational systems today. My friends, life is not one big experiment And we can't tamper with our biological makeup without grave consequences. We live in a culture where young people are promoted and and prompted to question their, their, their psychosexuality as never before. But you know, as, uh, as this phrase has been referred to, a house built on lies will eventually collapse. And that will happen. And what will happen when the public realize that they have supported a cause based on lies more than on truth? How will people respond when they realize that they have been duped? This kind of liberation, gender reassignment, is a lie. And we can't provide physical solutions for psychological incongruence. We need to address the matters of the heart and the mind. The best solution is to help people to be at home in their bodies from the inside out. Rather than sending a little boy to school dressed as a girl, promoting same-sex surgery coupled with a lifelong hormonal regimen on a teenager or even on an adult. And we must invite people, invite all people to turn towards their body rather than away from it. You know, John 1, 5 says, let the light shine in darkness, even if the darkness doesn't comprehend it. And as Christians, we have to be willing to speak the truth without fear on all of these matters. My friends, as we talked about a number of weeks ago, God doesn't make mistakes. He's not the ultimate oppressor. He knew what he was doing when he made you and me and every human being. I want to return once again to Romans chapter 12 that we read at the opening of the sermon this morning. We see once again, Paul says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, friends, as as Christians and as human beings, we're created to worship God alone. And worshiping God means presenting to God our bodies. This actually has several realities that we have to understand. First of all, loving our bodies. If we're going to worship God and we're going to honor Him and present our bodies to Him, we have to love our bodies. When I say that, I mean loving God's plan and His designs for our gender. He knew what was best. Who are we to think that we know better than God? God knew best when He made us. And so we must love the gender that God has made us. That we are male or female for a reason. And that God has a plan for you and me. And so transgenderism is essentially rebellion against God's design for our bodies. It's a form of self-hate. Nancy Piercy, who I referenced earlier, said it this way, The reason sin is so tragic is that it destroys a human being, a priceless masterpiece that reflects the character of the supreme artist. She's right. When when Scripture talks about do not be conformed to the world, it means that we shouldn't be conformed to the way our culture thinks. 
We shouldn't be conformed to the, the way our culture thinks around us. That the self is a, is a faulty foundation. We have to understand that reality. And our feelings are not a solid foundation. That we have to understand and reject the culture's understanding of self and feelings. But we are to be rather transformed or renewed in our thinking. Not accepting the way our culture thinks, but to accept what God says in His Word. The mind is the battlefield, my friends, when it comes to each of these matters. If you have a family member or a loved one is struggling with their their gender and their their identity, the, the battlefield is raging in their heart and mind. And what we as Christians must do is pray for them, but also pray that God would transform our thoughts. You know, this battle that we see that's going on in our culture and in in the mind of many people is fought on a lot of different fronts. Maybe it's fought in the area of memories of the past. Maybe it's fought on the area of sexual fantasies. Maybe distorted patterns of thought that have been developed over time. The battle rages. And there are many people that really, really struggle. But my friends, we must let the truth of God's word reshape our thoughts. Again, we're not to accept ourselves. You know, as we talked about last week, we're born into sin. We're rebelling against God. No, we must deny ourselves and trust in the Lord. We certainly accept who God has made us as far as our gender, but we're talking about denying our flesh, denying our sinful ways of thinking. My friends, we're not called to live our truth, but rather the truth. Alyssa Childers said it this way, the secret is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances. So the invitation is to reconnect with our true identity, to reconnect not only with the gender that God made us, but most importantly, our identity in Jesus Christ. That is our root identity. And I want to just give some advice maybe for those of you that are either struggling or you know somebody in your life that is struggling. Get around people who affirm God's true design for your life. Don't interact regularly with people who simply want to reinforce lies. Be careful of the company you keep. And this is why it's so sad is what is going on in a lot of our schools and educational systems, universities, is because we get kind of a group think and it, people begin to buy these lies wholesale and there isn't anybody, there are a few that do speak up, but generally everybody just kind of swims in these lies. As Christians, we need to be careful of the company we keep. And even if you are battling yourself with some of these matters, Get around people that will affirm who God has designed you to be and challenge you to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So the first area that when we're talking about presenting ourselves to God and presenting our bodies is we need to love our bodies. We need to love, in other words, who God has designed us to be. The second area is to present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice unto Him. As I mentioned earlier, God planned your gender even before you were conceived. God assigned your gender to fulfill specific purposes. Our job is not to rebel against that. If we're going to flourish as God would have us, we are to accept and welcome that reality. We must decide to embrace our masculinity or femininity and discern this as God's will for our lives. You know, you could say that there's a kind of a a self-love that comes from accepting God's love for us. That He gives us the dignity and value in our identity as male and as female. And so therefore, we must use our bodies in a way that glorifies and honors God. Sexually, certainly, but in every area. Talking about eating habits, talking about exercise, taking care of our bodies the best we can. You know, some of us may condemn drag queens or transvestite behaviors, as we should, but maybe we should also condemn gluttony in our culture as well, because both are a violation of worship of God. Am I equating those two? No. But neither practices are acceptable. Honoring God with our bodies this, this is actually a comprehensive issue, 
honoring God with our bodies. We're not just singling out this one area, even though transgenderism is our focus this morning. We're talking about using our bodies in a way that glorifies God. You know, you, we condemn and we, we certainly stand against what we see in suicide and how the enemy gets a hold of people in the moment to make a decision to take their life. But who of us, through a series of terrible eating and misusing our bodies, are, are, are destroying, kind of, kind of allowing kind of a slow suicide, shaving off years of our life that could be used for the glory and honor of God because we're not taking care of them the way we should. That's a rabbit trail. But I do think it's worth mentioning this morning. When we talk about using our bodies to glorify God, this is comprehensive. But we need to be clear, our core identity must be defined by our association with Jesus Christ. We cannot fix ourselves. Christ must do this in us. Amen? He has the highest claim in our lives. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 22. This is actually a passage of Scripture. You might think, well, how does this relate to the subject matter that we're talking about this morning? But just bear with me for a few moments. Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Uh, Listen to what this story and this episode that happened here. It says, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his talk, and they sent their disciples to him, along with Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what, are, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. Now just to give you a little bit of a context here to what is going on, the the religious leaders were trying to set a trap for Jesus. Basically, they knew that there was a crowd around Jesus when they were were asking this question. They're saying, is it lawful to pay taxes unto Caesar? They knew that Jesus, if he answered either way, would get in trouble. If Jesus answered, yes, you should pay taxes unto Caesar, all the Jewish people would say, who is this guy that he's affirming the Roman leadership that we adamantly defy? So he couldn't answer yes, but if he answered no, if the Roman authorities are there, they're saying, Jews would say, well, Jesus, you're saying you shouldn't pay taxes unto Caesar. You know, you're basically going to be uh, you know, rep- uh, reprimanded and, 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 and really come to a place where you're destroyed by the Romans. And so they're trying to trap him. But notice Jesus' answer, and he knew really how to shut them up. He basically said, whose image is on the coin? Because ultimate authority belongs to the one whose image is on it. You know, it's interesting, I I did a little investigative work this week. And do you know that here in America, it is illegal to deface coins? According to Section 331 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code, provides criminal penalties for anyone who fraudulently alters, defaces, mutilates, impairs, diminishes, falsifies, scales, or lightens any of the coins coined at the mints of the United States. Think of it, if you have a coin, it's your coin in the sense you can purchase and use it however you want. Actually, you can probably buy less today with a coin than you could 20, 30 years ago because of inflation, but nonetheless, we're all dealing with those challenges. But it's coin and minted by the U.S. government or whatever nation you're in. Isn't it interesting when Jesus said, whose image is on the coin? Caesar's. He said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. Really what is implicit on this is as human beings, whose image do we bear? Who has the highest claim in our lives? And to deface, what are these, falsify, diminish, mutilate, is to diminish the precious mint of God and who he made you and me to be. God has the highest claim on us. 
And yes, the fall has devastated that image. But I still see it. I see it in the drug addict. I see it in the prostitute. I see it in the online hacker. I see it in the person struggling with identity issues. My friends, we have to remember, Clayhouse, that God has the highest claim on us because we are bearers of his image. And my young friend, if you're struggling with your gender and your identity, turn to God. Turn to your body, not away from it. Accept who God made you to be. And he will show you who you really are. You, in turn, can present your body to him as an instrument of righteousness. That just as a coin can be used in any number of ways, Likewise, our bodies can be used in a way that glorifies God, and we can't just do whatever we want, but we glorify God by presenting our bodies to Him as instruments of righteousness. I want to just invite you to stand your feet at this time. God, you have the highest claim. You fashioned us. You knitted us together in our mother's womb. We cannot deface, mutilate, destroy the work that you've made. And yes, Lord, we are fallen, we are frail. But Lord, in the short time you do give us, we want to use our bodies as instruments for righteousness. We want to present to you ourselves that we be used for your honor. And Lord, we pray for our culture today and the confusion that we see so prevalent, prevalently around us. Lord, that you would help us to be voices of clarity, that you would help us to be people of light, that would help people to discover and know their true worth and their true value. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to shine brightly and use our bodies in a way that glorifies you. Lord, would you bring an awakening in this nation? Lord, we are so confused. We're so, we've wandered so far, Lord. Lord, would you come and bring revival? And would you come and bring an awakening? Begin with us, Lord transform us, transform our thoughts that we would be conformed to your image and likeness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.